Okay. Yeah, I got a couple of them. All right, welcome again to Social Distillation, the submarine still of the internet, where we attempt to drop the bead and pour white lightning straight onto your brain. What are we talking about today, Samuel? Well, uh, we we I spent the weekend with you at your house helping you build a fence, and we yep. talked about a lot of things uh, that we probably wanted to talk about, and I appreciate, actually, the fact that you just let me puke out like ideas and feelings and stuff. Uh, and you actually didn't talk much when we were having our cigar and, and, uh, I dominated the conversation. So however much of that you want to bring up, I don't know. Uh, but you before that had wanted to talk about, uh, we definitely need to talk about probably the Trump trials. Uh, you wanted, you, you mentioned talking about the st statistic changes to the MLB stuff, mm -hmm. uh, which I have some thoughts about, uh, what else did we talk about? Oh, we talked about a ton of stuff, but some of it was more gender relationship stuff that might be its whole own episode at some point. So that's always uh, a deep, dark rabbit hole. No, I, I like to get in the deep holes, but, you know, that's just me. Uh, no, l l let's start with let's start. easy. Let, let's start with the Trump trials, because that's yeah, be pretty quick and, and painless. Let's start with the big orange gorilla in the room. Yeah. Um this is there's the I have I have two main thoughts on on this and I want to get your take on it. Um first of all to to set this up, I found a pretty good uh a, a pretty good ar uh, article on this on Town Hall, which is a more right-leaning website but it's more kind of you would say more in the moderate sphere than in the you know libertarian sphere like cato would be or the more maga like uh breitbart would be oh, speaking of the libertarians uh i saw this morning there uh the state uh libertarian uh who, who would have to certify them being on the ballot are yeah. already rejecting their candidate in some states, Montana being one of them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Cause he's like, so this is my, okay. So w w let me, let me just put a little, little 30 second plug in here from last week's conversation. The libertarian national convention uh, got together and booed, you know, Trump and booed RFK and booed all these people. And th at least they got to say, you know, end the fed. Right. And then they elected the most woke candidate they had on their ballot. Yeah. <laughs> and he's basically open borders and wokeism and all trans this. all the kids. Trans all the kids cuz freedom, right? Yeah. And uh the uh so it was like you just rejected you just elected what you were saying you reject. And uh so it was a shit show. And now mm. the uh the the people that are responsible at the state level are like mm, yeah, no, you don't represent us. Uh so Libertarian Party, enjoy one more year of being on the ballot because it's probably going to be it. Oh, really? Uh, I mean, I didn't know it's that bad. If they don't pull 3%, they don't get the automatic. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I, I, the, I was actually going to touch on RFK speech because um, you talked about the booing. And, and well, there actually, was he didn't get booed at all. What's he, funny about his speech everybody. <laughs> is there were a number of times where it was like a hesitant clapping and then the rest of you know, the whole room started clapping. And it was like someone started. Yeah, well, I agree with that. Wait, but it's RFK Jr. I'm so confused. I'm, yeah. I'm supposed to be booing this guy because he's not one of us. But the what things he, he were saying were spot on. What he did right, and yeah. I'm I'm combining his speech with the interview he did with uh, Tim Pool at the same event. Uh, so if you only watch one yeah. or the other, you don't get the full effect. But if you watch them both together, what yeah, I he... haven't watched the Tim Pool interview yet. I just I, I did watch his full speech, and it was great. And actually, uh, take Tim Pool out of it because he was pretty political during his part of it mm -hmm. but he had a guest one of his normal contributors on there luke uh Rudkowski, who is like the journalist journalist he's the guy that will show up at the hotel when the guy when the politician is cheating on his wife and question him walking out you know he's that kind of journalist and he didn't hold back 
he was like, okay, so this is the thing that bothers me about you. Tell me about it. And he would, he would put that question out there. And, uh, uh, one of the things, so combine the speech with that kind of hardcore interview. And one of the things that he was presented with was, well, you were a typical Kennedy before COVID. And now you're saying all these different things. And RFK's response was, if COVID didn't change you, are you a human kind of answer? Mm -hmm. He was like, yeah, my position changed on a lot of things because I saw the overreach. It was evident to everybody, and that was exposed by COVID. And he, he was like, oh, I used to be more optimistic too, but now I'm not, and we need to mm -hmm. change things. And so it was like, that was the perfect response. It was just like, yeah, okay. So a lot of people's judgments of him are still pre-COVID Kennedys. And now there are still things I would disagree with him on, but at the same time, it's like, okay, let's let's assess things as they are versus as they were and he you know i i i am skeptical too about someone who completely changes their position well but, but see i don't think he completely changed and and i think the the premise of the he wasn't a typical kennedy if you just look at the fact that he wasn't in government this yeah, is the well, first is time true, he's yeah. run for office so the core <clears throat> the core of who he is and what he's saying now was already there when he was fighting against you know big business and and as i said last time and the epa he's not just fighting against big business a lot of what he was fighting with environmentally was against the freaking government who kept screwing things up and then that that kind of shifted in the early 2000s he's talked about this of when he started looking into big pharma and and he he had been being told for years and years hey someone needs to look into this someone needs to look into these rhymes with maxines and and he was kind of dismissing it and didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. But then he's he's talked about how when he finally started to look at it and went, oh, my God, there is there. I don't know what's going on here, but something's going on here and we need to take a look at it. And and so the core was already there. I think what radicalized him and a lot of people and, and this actually we're not off topic here because this actually ties into one of my main thoughts on the Trump trial is. All the things that happened with with the lockdowns and with the mandates and various other things shown a very bright spotlight on how this is not a, a, a group of problems. This is a, you know, as one of the things I said when we were talking that we might get into while we were watching Lawman Bass Rees, which is freaking awesome, is, you know, in, in a way. The, the CRT DEI people are right. There is a systemic problem. It's just not the system they say it is. Yep. And actually the system they problem, say it is, is part of the problem. problem. It, 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 exactly. Because, because remember when all that stuff came forward, it was when two factions on opposite sides of the aisle had the same idea. And that was Occupy Wall Street and the Tea mm -hmm. Party. Mm -hmm. And what what were they both against was the same thing that actually set shook hands. So I read a part of so part of uh, D'Angelo and Sensoy. Uh, Are we all even equal? Is their book, and they have a a whole uh, chapter in there where it's the the white worker and the black black worker and then the white employer mm -hmm. and. The, the white employer shakes hands with the white employee to keep the black worker down. But it's the opposite of that. It was a case where the, the, the black worker and the white worker were starting to shake hands and the white employee, uh, white employer said, Oh, you know what? We need to divide those two. And that's when all of this wokeism came out and they said, oh, this postmodern philosophy that's been going around the law schools, that's that's a perfect opportunity to do this. And they shook hands with these people and they propped up certain individuals, you know, uh, the 1619 Project, whatever her name is, mm -hmm. Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, Ibram X. Kendi. Uh, uh, it, these are even post- Sharpton and uh, and Reggie Jackson people. These are the people that are propped up now to push this agenda because what it does is it 
if we're fighting about this stupid thing, then we're not questioning Goldman Sachs. We're not questioning yeah. BlackRock. We're not questioning Blackstone. We're not questioning Vanguard. We're not questioning Disney. We're not questioning all these things because, well, we are, but in a way that is actually more divisive than it is coming together because otherwise the people of America, which the majority of us, I I don't think anybody know this, but the majority of us don't make a million dollars a year. Right. So, you know, I see these, these websites, uh, our, our friend that his name starts with a J always posts from the, the other 98%. Mm-hmm. The other 98% is a Facebook page made by the 2% to keep us divided. And I, we can't get it across to him, but other than that, it's this, the, these things are, 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 uh, very, uh, frustrating, I should say, to say the least. So go on. I, I said 30 seconds. We ended up with what's eight, 10 minutes. Well, it, it's a lot of it is a preview of <clears throat> the stuff I want to talk about and, and other things we might talk about here of, but, but first things first, if, um, if you haven't really been following this or if you don't have a legal mind, and you're and you're wondering what's going on here and this is one of my frustrations and why i i pulled this article up specifically is because the first three paragraphs i'm going to read here it's a it's a pretty lengthy piece but the first three paragraphs are a good summary of why this case is so problematic to put it nicely so if you're wondering what all the yelling is about and you haven't seen anyone actually explain the case then here is a good explainer before we get to the um, the okay, now what thoughts? So this is a guy named Guy Benson. He's a youngish guy, but you know he's been around. I've been reading his stuff for you know maybe a decade now, uh, off and on. And this is a on on town hall, which, like I said, is is kind of a more traditional conservative uh, publication. My job is to synthesize political developments and analyze them. I'll confess that right now I'm at a loss. We've encountered countless highly unusual or unprecedented moments in our politics over the last eight years or so, but this one is unlike anything we've ever witnessed. Quite literally, a former president of the United States and a current leading contender for the presidency has been convicted of 34 felonies by a New York jury. The crimes in question were internal corporate bookkeeping miscategorizations committed nine years ago. There was no victim in these bookkeeping miscategorizations, which were subsequently deemed records falsifications, misdemeanors. They stemmed from a sexual encounter Donald Trump had with a porn star, which he sought to cover up via a non-disclosure agreement. The woman was paid six figures to abide by the agreement. The money was furnished to her by Trump's sleazy personal lawyer. Trump then reimbursed said sleazy lawyer over a period of time. This is all very sordid business. None of it was criminal. Those reimbursement payments were categorized as legal fees as selected from a pre-populated drop-down menu embedded in the company's software. They were not listed as hush money payments to a porn star. Duh. According to Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, a hardcore anti-Trump partisan who campaigned as such, that constituted a crime. Others disagreed, including other very lefty people. Bragg's predecessor in the office looked at the same facts and chose not to pursue a case. The Federal Department of Justice looked at the same facts and chose not to pursue a case. And that this wasn't hit Trump's Department of Justice. This was after Biden was elected. His Department of Justice also looked at it. Same thing with the Federal Elections Commission looked at the possibility that these actions represented a campaign finance violation and chose not to pursue even a civil case or a fine. But Bragg exploited his authority, usually reserved in his world for downgrading charges, including for violent crimes, to charge these long ago misdemeanor at worst acts as felonies. Why not stick with misdemeanor charges, which are rarely prosecuted by Bragg? Because those statutes of limitations expired in 2019. To make a case viable during this election cycle, which I believe has been the entire point from the beginning, they had to be felonies. So Bragg invented what even the New York Times acknowledged as a never-before-attempted legal theory under which the bookkeeping miscategorizations were part of a conspiracy that involved another crime. That turned them into felonies under this strained, untested bank shot. 
Ultimately, the judge in the case who donated to his defendant's political opponent in their last election mashup told the Manhattan jury that they could select from a menu of three options that could be considered the critical felony creating other crime. This is key here. These options were not adjudicated at trial, let alone proven. They weren't spelled out in the indictment. The defense was not able to defend against them. Attempts at educating the jury on the most likely of the options were barred by the Biden donor judge. A top expert's highly relevant testimony was preemptively disallowed and therefore never heard. One of the prosecutors in the courtroom joined Bragg's legal team from President Biden's Justice Department, where he'd been serving as the third highest ranking official. He quit and became an assistant in a local DA's office, which is unheard of. This man, who has paid thousands of dollars for political consulting by the Democrat National Committee during Trump's presidency, clearly had a very specific objective in mind. Days before Trump's conviction, his electoral opponent's team held a campaign event at the courthouse. These facts in isolation, and especially taken together, are breathtaking. So there's the nuts and the bolts of the case. And I was looking for it. I couldn't find on Twitter, I, I stumbled across last week a, a very lengthy thread by someone who is a lawyer and used to be, I don't remember if he was the head of the FEC or an FEC commissioner, so a high-ranking guy in the FEC, who explained the particulars, that FEC part of it, that the reason the FEC didn't pursue this, even for a fine, let alone a civil case against Trump and the Trump campaign, was that the the what constitutes campaign business is very specifically spelled out it is not subjective now the the uh the base statute sounds kind of subjective and he quotes it but then he goes through down in the statute and then through regulatory administration and through the courts this is something that is very objective that that there are clear guidelines for what constitutes personal and campaign funds. And so under the FEC's very black and white guidelines for what is personal and what is campaign related, this is not a campaign fund. And he is well within his rights to use his own personal money to deal with this issue and not report it because it's not campaign related. Period. Because if you if you go with this legal theory that Bragg is using, then everything anyone does or might do because they might run for office would be subject to campaign disclosure. Because anything you could argue would influence the election, because that's that's the law here that he's using is that this would influence the election therefore this was a campaign expense therefore it was illegal to not disclose this and to not file it as such therefore since more than one person was involved here it was a conspiracy therefore it is a felony you see the long bizarre rabbit trail we had to go through to get to trump as a felon yeah which is why I'm fighting this in the social sciences and you see it in law. The word theory means something. The word theory is actually very concrete. Uh, the, the, the laws of gravity the, is the, is a theory because it is proven. And there is over time, there is no conflict to what constitutes the laws of gravity on earth. Right. But they keep throwing this word around because legal theory, we can make whatever we want. You know, uh, theories of human development had 10 different theories in the same textbook, which alone disproves that any of them are theories because there are nine other conflicting ways of thought right so that the the word theory actually has a meaning and the fact that you have nine conflicting ways of thought disproves that any of them are a theory they're all a hypothesis they, they're all an opinion let, let me interject to to add some additional clarity here so 
what you're saying, how this works, using physics as an example, Newton's laws were a theory, even though they were laws. And the difference between that and Newton's hypotheses is that when the theory of relativity came along, they didn't debunk or invalidate Newton. They modified Newton. When no, they didn't modify it. They extended it. Extended, added to yeah, because the because the theories of relativity actually only matter when you're looking at Mercury going around the sun, right? Well, so it's it, it, the things we deal with in our regular life are still subject to sp specific the, and general relativity. Both they expanded, and then those theories were theories because they were proven mathematically and proven with observation. Mm -hmm. But they weren't complete. They were just about this. Yeah. Well, and, and even if comes... quantum physics and string theory become relevant, they would be included in that. And then not... along comes yeah. the next yeah. thing, which was the quantum stuff, which was black holes and what's his face? Well, got black holes where uh, God divides by zero, right? Hawking and, yeah. and everything. And and that didn't invalidate general relativity. That didn't invalidate Einstein. That just added to our greater understanding mm -hmm. of this whole. That's yeah, that's it, how it, those are theories and not hypotheses. Yeah, if so so anybody tweaked. who's taking calculus, right? You still use algebra in calculus. So, you know, Newton's theory would be a, a the algebra of the calculus of the universe, right? So, mm -hmm. it is still relevant to everything we deal with on earth. So, so but when you talk about legal theory though, they use that word to say, oh, well, we can revamp things to the way we want the theory of this, the theory of that. And, the, and this is very common in the social sciences in general. And realistically, all the wokeism and all the stupid shit that we have to deal with right now all started in the legal departments. Mm -hmm. It was it was bell hooks. It was all of all of those uh, uh, Angela Davis, all of those people in the legal departments, uh, Crenshaw, that brought this forward and some of them had legitimate beefs because they grew up in segregation right so it mm -hmm. you know it it was the extension of that but at the same time when they started saying oh well if we play with this word this word here and this word there and and kind of do, we can get our way and that's that's so, the problem and we're seeing that in real time we haven't you're... seen it in a while because mm -hmm. it was so subversive but we're seeing it in real time with these legal battles because it's not just trump it started with alex jones bingo so that that is point number one of the two points i wanted to make here which is <clears throat> what what you just said the, the best um analysis of the lawfare against trump that i have heard what is from steve dace and and what he said is a is a soundbite way of explaining what you just said there which is that this is what is going on here is not a legal proceeding in search of a political outcome it is a political desire in search of legal justification so they want this political thing to ha they, they have this political thing they want to accomplish how do I tweak and torture and twist the language to make that happen? It, it, it is, it seems like a fine line, but it's a big effing difference. The reason right. it's such a big effing difference is because we have a system of checks and balances. This, this ties right into what I talked about last time or, or whenever it was that I talked about why I'm voting for RFK is because right now, probably he he's he's still i'm list. still waiting for yeah. by vp i'm still waiting for vp announcements yeah but all of this all of this screeching about how this is the most important election and if we don't reelect trump or if we don't get biden out of office the country is doomed as i have said before if we ever get to that point the country is already lost because we we have a system of checks and balances to prevent exactly that none of the checks and balances have worked in this lawfare because all along the way, something should have stopped this. Well, we'll see what happens when the Supreme Court weighs in on this. So there, both, there, both there the, is still that. There is yeah, still both, that. both the state and the appellate courts. Yeah, because th this was this was a state 
trial and so you go through the state appeals but the pro- it does the, the affect problem for me does... is yeah is anytime a presidential candidate is put on trial it should be a federal affair i don't care what the crime is and where it was committed it should be a federal affair uh that that uh, there is no possibility of a fair jury when you've already reached the point of president because everyone in the country already has an opinion. Mm-hmm. You, trial by jury goes out the window at that point, which is why we have the impeachment process. Mm-hmm. The founding fathers thought about this because even in the old days of Pony Express, you knew who the damn president was. Mm-hmm. So there is no possibility of a fair trial because everybody's already got an opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and... and- we may get to that point, but uh, uh, again, something, e- even once you get to the point, you know, it, it is somewhat astounding to me mm-hmm. that, and I, and I don't remember who I heard criticizing the Trump legal team for this of, yeah, only 12% of Manhattan, uh, Trump only got 12% of the vote to, rather in Manhattan. So surely you should have been able to find at least one person. Okay. But even if you find that one person are, do they have the intestinal fortitude to be um, mm-hmm. to be that one guy in 12 angry men? Yeah. And, and we, we always, we always say, Oh, yeah. I would be the one that would stand up. Yeah. And I wouldn't, I would be the one that wouldn't take the bribe. And I'm like, have you ever had a million dollars put in front of you? Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen a stack of bills that makes a million dollars? I know have, I would struggle. <laughs> have Have you ever had 11 people yelling at you to know this is the way we're going to do it and pressuring you to shut up and sit down? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I do have some sympathy that even if they did find that one person who was a Trump person, is that one person the one in a thousand who has what it takes to stand up? To well, those 11 and the way people. they publicize these things, mm-hmm. you're not only thinking about the other jurors in the room, you're thinking about if your name will be leaked. And yeah, your am family I gonna be will be threatened. Yeah, am I gonna be harassed. Be doxed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that the there there is no way to have a fair trial for somebody and, that and, big. And that is both that is both a legal political failing and a cultural failing. That mm-hmm. that 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 potential that potential person standing in the breach has to think about those things. And that additional pressure outside of the jury deliberation room is going to be there is again, how the country is already lost, or at least has already fallen. We're not lost yet. I I should stop saying lost. I should say fallen because we we can challenged. We can recover. We have been in very dark places before as a country and we have recovered. So it is doable. You know, if, if you look at, um, well, heck just go back, all, go all the way back to the revolution, which was a very close run thing. And, and how many, how many times it looked like the revolution was going to end badly for, for the Patriot side and then the civil war. And then, you know, the, all, all of the, uh, uh, all of the failings of the progressive movement, all of the the anti-American, anti-constitutional things that were done in the name of progress and how for a time we overcame that. And then, you know, on and on, you can, you can pick your point, your low point for America as a country. And, and yet we managed to recover and we managed to come out even better on the other side. So I shouldn't say we're lost, but we're definitely fallen. And are we going to get back up or not? No, my mission here as the the more liberal side of this, the conversation, my mission is to not be lost, but not to swing the other way. Because that's also a possible Mm -hmm. outcome. The there's, there's three possible outcomes. We keep doing what we're doing and we just completely collapse like the Roman Mm -hmm. empire. Or we come out of it okay, like you're just talking about, which is the optimistic approach, or we swing the other direction. And personally, I don't think Trump is the swing the other direction, like a lot of people think, like Sam Harris or whatever think. Mm -hmm. I think Trump is the precursor to the swing the other direction. He is the thing that the, the, we'll we'll just keep using terminology, the left is using as as a demon, which causes the real demon to arise. 
that that's why I think his VP pick, and I, I assume that's why you're waiting on that because that's going to be a strong indication of what happens next. Mm-hmm. Because whoever he picks as B- VP is going to be the presumptive heir to MAGA, whatever the hell that means, and the presumptive GOP nominee in the next cycle. So who's that going to be? Are you going to pr- pick some bland, vanilla, swamp creature like Tim Scott? Or are you going to pr- pick, um, are you going to reach across the aisle with someone who has had their eyes opened like a like a Tulsi Gabbard, mm-hmm. even though she's not on our side when it comes to a lot of the issues. She is on our side in the we're in a bad place and the You're the, saying our side is in Republicans, right? Our, our oh, side because I love Tulsi. So uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, she's not on our side in the traditional conservative Republican, but she mm-hmm. is on our side in those of us who have formed this coalition of what the hell is going on and how did things get so crazy? Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know what? He, picks I, he, he is he, going to be a strong indication of what happens next. He fell off the radar. And I'm wondering if Trump did this on purpose because he kind of le- leaked like this won't be the person. Mm-hmm. But there's one person that is like out there with him doing everything right now. And that's Vivek. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, you said he's not going to be my VP in a little interview somewhere, somehow that somebody soundbited that Mm -hmm. nobody knows where it came from. But at the same time, he's the one that went with you to the Libertarian Commission. He's the one that's speaking out on this. He's the one that's speaking out on that. And I'm starting to see these patterns show up. I think I know who our next uh, NIH health czar is going to be. And that's uh, Vinay Prasad. Because he's starting to make the rounds in those is, circles. Is he the Florida Surgeon General? No, you're thinking of uh, Lapido. La, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're thinking. No, I'm thinking of. Uh, so Vinay Prasad is the uh, UC uh, San Francisco epidemiologist that oh, okay. has been big on the, all the COVID stuff. But okay. he's he's played it really safe. But now he's playing it a lot less safe. And he's playing it in the direction of will kind of pull people from different sides of the aisle to the direction that is anti-Fauci kind of kind of direction. So I I have a feeling he might, I I think Trump is recruiting these internet personalities for his next administration because it's not only people that have have done things the right way, but also they're people that have developed a following. And, and you know, Trump, he's all about the entertainment uh, value of everything. So I think he, I think that's the direction he's going now. And I think that puts Vivek higher on the list. I think, I think it's Scott or Rubio if he wants to unify the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. But there's an equal chance that it's Tulsi or Vivek on the other side because they unify the people. Yeah. <clears throat> And I, I hope it's the unify the people route and not unify the establishment route. But that that's why I'm waiting, because there's two very different directions he could go. So that that leads to the last point on this. The second point that, that I wanted your uh, feedback on, and you've, you've pretty much already given it. But now I'm curious, anyone else out there who considers themselves a normie? And by that, I mean... Someone who kind of oh, knows what's in the I'm news. I'm not a normie but, in any way, yeah. shape, or the form. But, but. You, you kind of know what's in the news, but you're not really following the news. And this is a, a problem that I have with like Tim Pool, where he's kind of become captured by his own movement, if mm-hmm. you will. He's become very Trumpian, and he's he's one of these leading voices that I've seen of, you know, and a big voice of someone with a really well, big following. He, yeah, he's got to be the leading voice because he's the first podcaster to get Trump on a podcast. That's, and, that and, already tells you everything. The and, the only thing that can compete is if one of these lefty podcasters can get Biden on, really. Yeah. So he is one of these big voices that after the verdict is is saying something along the lines of they just gave they just gave the election to Trump. Trump just won the election mm-hmm. because America won't stand for this. OK, let me take you back, son, because I know you're a bit younger than I am. And you haven't been doing this as long. You haven't been a political nerd as long as I am. You you started in a very different space. And once again, I started way too, I got way too into politics starting in eighth grade, which isn't healthy. 
I was shocked in 2012 because if you look at the objective numbers of what was happening in America, as far as it was the early, it was the early days of BLM, the, the, uh, the economy, which is the number one predictor usually had leveled off and it had kind of sort of started to, to track back up from the great recession, but it really hadn't recovered that well. It really, it, it was kind of limping along. So the, the economy wasn't great. There was already the beginnings of social unrest and nobody liked Obamacare. This is what's forgotten because you look at stuff now, you look at polls now and it's kind of become accepted. But in 2012, people were still pissed off about Obamacare and about the way it was passed. So I thought there was absolutely no way that Obama could get reelected. Okay, except I was living in a bubble of listening to Rush Limbaugh and going through the Drudge Report, which at the time so, was very remind rightly. me because I always get these flipped. Uh, was it Romney or McCain? Romney was twenty twelve. Okay, 2012 Romney was twenty. Was McCain was, was twenty two thousand eight. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I so, I always get those flipped. But either way, you have the same candidate, Romney or McCain. Exactly. Uh, but but you but I also thought you had lost the appeal of we're electing our first black president, so you'd lost that appeal, and so I thought there was going to be a big drop off. But again, I was so do you think, in the bubble. So do you think McCain would have won in 2012? No. No? I, I think I think looking at it objectively is and, and this is what this is what I'm going to get to is because it is not enough to vote against someone. The the winner of a well, presidential it is with, election with the last one. Well, that's do you, true. Do you think but, 80 million people showed up to vote for the person we have now? I don't think yeah. <laughs> people showed up to vote, but that's well, okay. Story. Mailed in, mailed but, but, in. Uh... But even if you look at the fortification, um, the fortification was enough to push Biden over the edge in key swing counties and key swing states. Yeah. Well, and, so and, and, there and, were and, still but, a lot but, of people who showed up my and point... affirmatively voted for Biden because they because yeah. they didn't want Trump that badly. There's like, my my so, point is yeah. the Sam Harris. It's a it's a meteor headed towards Earth, and we need to do anything possible. But and that was that that is the ultimate statement of a voting against somebody, not yes. a voting for somebody. But on top of that, re remember the Biden campaign. Biden campaigned as a return to normalcy, and this is you pointed out. Hold on, wait a minute. Biden has always been. A, a, a floppy read going with the flow. He has no core set of values. He's just a politician. He's going to go wherever the Democratic Party tells him to go. And right now the Democratic Party is radical, has been completely radicalized. But that's not how he campaigned. He campaigned on a return to normalcy. He campaigned on a things have gotten crazy that that the Sam Harris's of the world were out there saying Trump, Trump is literally Hitler, but that's not what Biden was saying at the time. Most of the time he was, I'm going to push back on that in just a second. He was a return to normalcy. What we've been enlightened to was normalcy yeah, wasn't a good yeah. thing. That's true. That's yeah. true. <laughs> but, but the point being, he still gave at least something of an affirmative, um, forward looking vision. Trump was too focused on the swamp and the swamp is out to get me and, you know, all of this and that he didn't do as good a job as, you know, MAGA wasn't just a, a slogan or a red hat. He made that a, a pivotal part of his 2016 campaign. So as much as he was disliked, as bad as his favorables and unfavorables were, he was still offering a forward-looking vision that coupled with Hillary being an awful candidate and an awful <laughs> person, let him eke out a victory, even though he, his, again, his numbers were so bad. The point being, you have to have something to vote for, not just against voting against something can be a, a significant component, but what's going to push you over the edge, especially with independence is going to be, are you offering a forward-looking vision? I don't see that right now in this campaign from Trump. It's too much about the lawfare, the swamp, the negativity. And, and well, I think the the problem, the, the, the thing I'm trying to uh, circle the square here is. I hated MAGA 
as a slogan, mm -hmm. make America great again, because I always thought it was should have been let's keep America great mm. at the time, at the time. Now it is actually more relevant because we went down a slippery slope where Obama was 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 not what he confessed to be. He was not anti-war. He bombed more than mm -hmm. Bush before him. He did a lot of these things. Oh, Obamacare, it was a handshake with the pharmaceutical companies, which we're still suffering from today. Uh, especially if you got diabetes, by the way. Insulin is expensive as hell. But uh it he was he was a little bit down the slope, but where we fell down the slope was now. So make America great again was not the right slogan in 2016. It's certainly more obvious now to, yeah, to the it, the average person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the problem so, is we got four years of you not making America great again. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I, I love a lot of things he did. I do love the, the no wars. That was great. But it doesn't help that, that the recency bias of your, the last year of your presidency was awful. Because mm -hmm. you handed over your administration to Fauci, who we could talk about, but I don't see the point because nothing is going to happen from these latest round of hearings. There's nothing new here. All of these, oh my gosh, these tremendous revelations. We talked about this years ago with the, with the the uh, both both the leaks and then the uh, Freedom of Information Act releases of these emails. We talked about this well, years did ago. Did you see the this story that they that they? Uh, uh... Use stupid internet tricks to keep the FO to, uh, to try and hide these things from. Yeah, they put a dollar course. sign yeah. instead of an A yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So to, it, to, it didn't have to, to be released, and I'm like, so, oh come on. And so you couldn't find it with with a, a plain search. Yeah. Anyway, so Guy Benson's uh, uh, conclusion here of this article, I think, is interesting to this second point because this is not someone. He's, he's not saying it in the way that the Tim Pool MAGA people of the world are, and he's not someone that I think would have been swayed by this. And so I find this conclusion interesting. This isn't a sign of solidarity with Donald Trump, the martyr. It's a sign of profound national distress. And he's, uh, for those of you just listening, he, he, he shares this tweet of he was one of these people who tweeted out an upside down American flag. Uh, I love our country, and I don't think it's melodramatic to believe or to say out loud that it is in trouble. None of the possible outcomes here seem likely to be particularly redeeming or hopeful. Optimism has its limits. Anger can quickly become a counterproductive cul-de-sac, and despair isn't a very American option. So I'll pray, then do my best to make a good choice, along with millions of others who feel politically adrift. My job is to synthesize political developments and analyze them. I'll confess that right now I'm at a loss. And, and to to set up, but right before that paragraph, he goes into his voting history from the primaries and the general of how he didn't vote for Trump in either the primaries or either of the general elections. And he urged conservatives to make a better choice. But right now, he's seriously considering voting for Trump because of this lawfare is so egregious. I just don't know. And I'm curious what anyone out there listening comment if you consider yourself a normie and and if you aren't really you haven't been pro trump but do, does this verdict have any impact does this sway you in either direction of uh because i just don't think there are enough normal independents out there to sway to come out and vote for you because i look at this and go but now, now, here's where I go back and forth, though, is because there's not enough independence. It's 43 percent of the voting. Right now. <laughs> yeah, right. But I, I look at this and go, how is this going to sway you? And I can give you this long laundry list of terrible things that have already happened. And and that didn't impact you. I mean, it's it's not like no one knew this case was coming. No one knew this was going on. This is this this particular case and the couple of others that are still to be adjudicated have been in the news for months and that didn't sway you. But now this verdict does. I just don't see it. And if you look at the 2020 election, you look at the 2022 midterm elections, you don't see the results. You don't see this result that people are proclaiming is going to happen, that Trump has won the election because people won't stand for this. 
I just don't see it. On the other hand, I can see how if you're more of a normie, if you're not closely following the news, if you're not, you know, covering yourself in this political awful, that this could be a wake up call. This could be a bridge too far. This could be a, oh, hold on. Things just got real here. So I can see how maybe it could sway enough people to help in the election, but we haven't seen it in the past. And so I'm highly skeptical. So let me speak as the independent here is it doesn't sway me at all either way, because I'm going to look at the the final day when I go to the voting booth, I'm going to look at who's remaining and I'm going to think about what their platform going forward is. And that's, that's actually the only thing that matters to me. Now, now, yeah, you want you want a bit of honesty and genuineness and everything, but realistically, that's gone out of the window for everybody involved. Uh, so, what are you going to do for the country going forward? And that's the only thing that matters to me, whether you paid off a porn star or not. But I, I mean, I'm, I know I'm more sexually liberal than most people, but at the same time, that's not something that affects how you run the country. It's also not anything new. I mean, since the eighties, we've known who's yeah. drawn Trump. Oh, okay, the so is. yeah, if, if you're if you're a, a Democrat, JFK and Marilyn Monroe. Sorry, <laughs> in fact, that actually gives me a little couple respect points for him. You know, it's just like it is what it is. All right, so just to to put a pin in this and finish this off. Um, I would also like to point out something that I had kind of forgotten about. And then it, it popped up from someone had shared this that, um, you know, I, I can I can talk about the I understand the the genuine as well as clickbait outrage from the talking heads. But the the faux outrage from elected members of Congress, give me a break. Um, this this came up in 2017 um, and has kind of been forgotten about. But we should remember that this is a thing. And this is, I purposely <laughs> took this from the CNN oh, website. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was wondering okay, so, if you were going to bring this up. So remember that th it, this came out in 2017 that when staffers uh, or, or other people, when they sue uh, members of Congress uh, for various shenanigans and infractions, we pay for that. There is a fund to pay this, what is basically, you know, hush money. So all sorts of members of Congress have basically paid hush money. And there are these uh, draconian ironclad NDAs that anyone who gets one of these settlements signs. So that's why we never hear about this stuff. This, this was one of the early swamp exposés of, hey, if you think Congress is bad, you don't know how bad it is. It's worse than you think. You don't dislike Congress enough. And so all of these nasty shenanigans, um, which th this article is focusing on sexual harassment, and that's a big part of it. But any of this other shady stuff that's going on, um, people are being paid off and they're being hushed up and – this is business as usual as far as Congress is concerned. Um, and I forgot that, that this partly came out because of uh, Al Franken <laughs> groping someone. Um, not just groping someone, groping someone who was asleep. Um, so spare me your righteous indignation, Chuck Schumer. Spare me. Okay. Uh, go look up for anyone who wants to get really pissed off, the Blaze bought and paid for. The Blaze did a it was 30, 45 minute little expose. It, it's on their YouTube page. There may be additional parts to it behind the paywall, but uh, there, there's a, a video up on their YouTube page called Bought and Paid For. They name names and they give numbers and they don't pick a side. Okay. Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's this heroine of MAGA and is making headlines again for the way she's grilling Fauci 
who cares? She's in this. She's in this documentary of uh, what bot and paid for is all about is the insider trading. That's not insider training because Congress gets to get away with it. Yeah. And this is one of the things that uh, bothers me about the, the system is it's very Jerry Springerish, and she is part of that AOC mm -hmm. on the other side. Uh, uh, the way these people are appointed to their positions of being able to do these front and center things when there's 250 something other Congress people available, it, it's, it's you, we are being fed a, a show because these are the most, okay. So the election here happens. These, these people are put forward and someone somewhere says, these are the people we're going to put front and center every time. Why is she always the one up there? Because she, creates headlines she's great for both sides she's great for both sides why is aoc up there all the time because she's great for both sides why isn't uh i don't know what's what's our guy name west uh something west why isn't he up there all the time because he's pretty normal i've talked to him in person he when when we first moved in this house he was going door to door talking to people in, in his district. Mm -hmm. And we sat for 45 minutes and talked about running a small business because he's, his start was running an AC uh, business, but you never see him in the news. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he's pretty milk toast. He's a, he's a Congress person of one of the biggest districts in Texas, but you never see him. Uh, because, Chip Roy, because, who I think is just south of you, I think he's, I think his district is around Corpus. He he's another one. He is, uh, he is like a fire breathing Baptist preacher, and so you would think he would get more mainstream airplay, except he's not saying things that are inflammatory for the sake of being inflammatory. He is trying to hold the GOP's feet to the fire, so they don't. No, neither side wants him out in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Because they want business as usual. Chip Roy for governor, by the way. <laughs> Get out of Congress and run for governor, Chip. It's you know, it, I I have my critiques, but I don't hate at it. Uh, I do have my critiques, and well, I'm pretty sure. And, uh, and my sure critiques Texas are usually term limit, so I, I think oh, yeah. Abbott's done. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. My, my critiques, the, the conservative side of the aisle would say, well, you're wrong. So, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it is what it is. Uh, I, I um, I've said before, as much as I think AOC is a nitwit and I disagree with pretty much everything she says, one of the interesting things that came up in this bought and paid for documentary, she actually believes what she says. Oh, no, no. She she is a zealot. She is not a nitwit. There's she, a difference. She, th yes, yes. There is a difference. She, she, is, she is actually highly intelligent. She is one of the few people that is brought up positively in this documentary of, and, and they talk to like really right leaning, like Matt Gates. I don't like the guy. I don't like the way he's acted, but he seems to generally believe in the, in this. No, well, I've, I've heard him in long form. Corrupt. Yeah. Long form podcast uh, uh, scenario. And I like that. Yeah, you're right. He, there's this is this is one of the critiques of of politicians is they won't go on these long form things. Mm -hmm. And this is something Rogan has said. Poole has said. Uh, uh, Williamson has said is no one can hold a fake themselves for three hours. Yeah, and that's yeah. why this this could be like the way to go is to get these people on these long form. Uh, kind of podcast ish because that's what it is right now. But the these these long form, you have to. It's a war of attrition at that point. Of can you keep up the facade, or are you going to have breaks in that as we that, go? That is a good point, and it is another reason why these fake Senate and House hearings are just soundbite machines because there is a big damn difference between. Zuckerberg sitting before a committee where each person has like five minutes to grill him and or he when already he was has on Rogan his canned answer and he gave everything. versus when he was on <laughs> Rogan and Rogan was able to walk him right into a pit that he fell right into. 
There's a big difference. Um, and if anybody wants to have me on Candace, I'm talking to you. You can have me on your your podcast any day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in person. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um uh speaking of this this segues us into uh because th this reminds me I don't I don't like him and I don't like some of the political things he's done tactically. But I do appreciate that that Matt Gates did go on with Whitlock for a good 30, 45 minutes uh, a while back. I, th I think it was when Gates called for uh, Speaker what's his bucket uh, to be to be ousted. McCarthy. For the, yeah, McCarthy for the Dingleberry we have, you know, that got us the Dingleberry we have now. And I, I didn't like it because I thought Gates was doing it mostly to set himself up for a run for Florida governor uh, because DeSantis is term limited. But I appreciated that he went on and he he one on one with someone who who Whitlock is not going to throw softballs at you. And 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 he he sat there and he answered the questions and he he, he was who he was. So I appreciated that. Speaking of Whitlock, um, th this came up while we were watching Lawman Bass Reeves because we we were talking about CRT and DEI and stuff. And I was. uh I had heard this, but I hadn't I hadn't seen the details. And I I was watching Whitlock the other day and I had gone on because uh, I was curious, what what is going on with all this Caitlin Clark nonsense? And I wanted to see his take and his explanation of what's going on here. And uh, and he had on Steve Kim, who's a, a primarily a boxing analyst. That's that's his forte as he loves boxing, but he also loves college football and he's been an ESPN analyst and he he hates ESPN and he was politely asked to leave um, because his his tweets weren't kosher. Um, but they got to talking about, for those of you who don't know, the uh, the MLB has just integrated the Negro League statistics with the MLB statistics. And I wasn't going there for this, but it was cool that someone who does this professionally and has a much bigger audience said what I was thinking, which was this was done because they wanted Ty Cobb to be knocked off the top spot mm. because he is so reviled in the baseball community. What he didn't bring up and, and I wish I had enough of, of a following to get his attention is Whitlock really needs to read this Ty Cobb biography, uh, Ty Cobb, a terrible beauty, not just because it's so good, but because the guy who wrote it is in Whitlock's wheelhouse, because this is someone a lot like Graham Hancock, who you're not an archeologist. Yeah, I know I'm a journalist. I've never said I'm an archeologist. This guy who wrote the book, He's wrote a number of these biographies and he's an investigative journalist. So that is why the book is so good and so compelling is because he actually investigated. He said, OK, well, this is what is said about Ty Cobb. This is what people have written in books. What was in the newspapers at the time? What were people saying at the time? He went and he looked at the newspapers. He dug up personal letters where he could. He dug up diaries and journals where he could. And he said, what were people saying at the time? If I was a journalist at the time, and it turned out that this idea that Ty Cobb was this awful racist is not only not true, it's horrifically 180 degrees from the truth. Because he, he includes this quote of Ty Cobb where someone went and asked Ty Cobb, I think it was in the 40s, or maybe the late 30s. It was it was it was right before Jackie Robinson. It was right before integration. And Ty Cobb's quote was something, you know, paraphrasing. Uh people at people ask me, can Negroes be professional baseball players? And I tell them they already are. Me meaning the level of play in the Negro League is professional these these men can play in major in the majors because they're already playing at a professional level that is high praise coming from the guy who played for over 20 years and th think about that in baseball statistics okay if if you are hitting the ball two out of three times 
you are elite. Okay. He was hitting the ball more than four out of 10 times. If you're hitting the ball one third of the time. Yeah. Because what yeah. is a, a point point three something is Oh yeah, like, one third, not two. Yeah, one third. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was about to say so if, no, nobody hits at a point six. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. If if if, if you're you hitting are, at a point six, you mm-hmm. and, and, someone's and some testing of the, your blood. That's what it some is. Some of the greatest mm. ever are considered so great because like Manny Ramirez and and Big Poppy Ortiz, one of the reasons they are considered so great is because they had that three to three fifty during the season. And then they were batting like six to 700 in the playoffs. They had these very brief runs where they were just phenomenal. So Ty Cobb, not only was the, was the lifetime leader in average, he managed to maintain that playing professionally for over 20 years. I think 21 to 23 years, something like that, that he played in the majors. It's ridiculous. And he managed to play at such a high level for so long that it didn't water down his stats. Well, now he is no longer the lifetime batting leader because a guy named Josh Gibson, who was a a catcher primarily for the Grays, I think I, I can't remember if he played for anyone else or not, but he was a he was considered a phenomenal hitter. He was considered the basically he was called the Babe Ruth of the Negro Leagues by a lot of people, and now he's on. Now he's on top. If you look up the stats for lifetime batting average, Ty Cobb is now number two and Josh Gibson is number one. Let me let me just talk about stats in general. They all have to reset at some point. And this is a pointless thought experiment mm-hmm. because they didn't play each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't play under the same circumstances. They didn't play each other. So if you what realistically should be is this block of MLB before integration, Negro League before integration, MLB after integration, and all of these things. Uh, I'm going to give an example with football. Uh, so NFL. Every season stat reset ne- last year because it was the first year we had a 17-game season. No season-leading records should count against the people who had them before i i believe because when the dolphins went undefeated wasn't it a 14, it was 14. Game yeah it was 14 yeah i was gonna bring up the dolphins don't worry because this is my problem with mcdaniels as the coach but uh but 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 say okay so let's go back to the original point point. Two thousand yards for a running back was a huge deal in the 16 game uh season so you had jamal lewis you had Barry Sanders. You had uh, Jerome Bettis. Those are the three I can think of off the top of my head that hit 2,000 yards in a single season rushing in a 16-game season. That can't be compared to the 14-game era. And now it can't be compared because we're probably going to see a bunch of running backs hit 2,000 yards now. Because we have a whole extra game to do it. All of those that hit 1,800 before might have been 2,000-yard rushers. We we have to reset the statistics when things change. And the same goes for when you integrated the MLB with the Negro League into one thing. Because now it's a different game because you're playing against each other. So the best of the best from the Negro League are going to be playing against the best of the best from the MLB because you're going to wash out the people who were in the MLB mm-hmm. because they didn't have to compete against Negro players. Mm-hmm. Are we allowed to say that? Against African-American players. That's YouTube what, censor us however term. you want. Yeah, yeah uh, We can't even use African-American anymore. Uh, against black players, which used to be the derogatory when we were young, but mm-hmm. now is the new thing. People of color. There we go. They weren't allowed to be. But in not there. colored people. You can't say that. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> but at the same time, the Negro League didn't have the best of the best of the MLB there. So exactly, the, these are completely different things that came together into one thing. So you reset the statistics. It, so it, if, I, if you want to have a historical statistical thing, have them, but have them separate. Exactly. And, and this, this is, um, it's called a this, confounding variable in research, by the way, which you so, try to eliminate. So this is a point Whitlock made that he's allowed to talk about because he's a big black guy and us pasty white people aren't allowed to talk about 
but and this Wait, is I'm white. Yes, Polish counts as white. Um, sorry. Except uh, Slavic is people of color in Europe. By the way. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, so Whitlock pointed out that one of the many problems with this, and you're not, you can't criticize this move. This this move was done for virtue signaling, and you're not allowed to criticize it because if you criticize it, you are automatically a racist. Except, hold on a second. Because of the way the Negro League was structured, they didn't have great stat keeping. We're not entirely sure what Josh Gibson's stats actually are. We just think we know. Satchel Page is another one. He gets brought up a lot of, oh, well, you know, to your point, you, you have to put an asterisk uh, by the stats for uh, uh, before integration because Babe Ruth never had to hit against Satchel Page. And that's true. It's a damn shame, and I've said this before, that the fans of the time and the fans uh, of subsequently are cannot look back, and not just Babe Ruth, but man, wouldn't you have liked to see Satchel Page pitch against the entire murderer's row? Which for, for anyone who doesn't know, I had to look this up to remember the names besides Musial and, and Gehrig, but um, uh. It refers to the Yankees of the 20s, and in particular, the 1927, which are, are widely considered and often brought up in the greatest team ever, was the Yankees of 27, which was Earl Combs, Mark Koenig, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Bob Usual, and Tony Lassery. Those were their first six batters, and they were all phenomenal. And that's why it was called Murderer's Row, because there was no break for the pitcher in those first six batters. Wouldn't you love to have the stats of Satchel Page pitching against those guys in the World Series? And we don't because of myopic bigotry of the time. But mm -hmm. it's also true that, you know, Josh Gibson never had to pit, had to hit against Dizzy Dean. It's it's a damn shame on both sides. Well, let's take it to basketball. So everybody talks about the GOAT conversation. Is it Kobe? Is it uh lebron is it is it jordan you know we is it curry we can't compare those we can't compare them all, at all because would lebron have done as well against the pistons of the 1980s uh, he's a flopper so he probably would have got his nose broken a few times right it, it's it, it's a different game different time so i always like the greatest player of this era conversation mm -hmm. because that actually compares apples to apples mm -hmm. you know who was the greatest player of the late 1980s michael jordan obviously who was the greatest player of the 90s kobe okay we got that well maybe kobe shack we can we can compare we can go back and forth there but who is the greatest player ever we don't know because mm -hmm. would jordan have done as well in the scoring era that curry is is benefiting from right now the the three point or nothing era that we're in now well no because he played against you know dumars and uh you know thomas and you know uh rodman and all of those guys he, he played a physical game and he was the exception to the rule at that time mm -hmm. kobe was as smooth as silk on everything he did but he wasn't the best three-point shooter. Would he be comparable with Curry right now? We don't know. Would he be comparable with Hakeem Olajuwon? Hakeem was a, was a different player. He was a different center than every other center in the league. Would he have competed with the, uh, the, the early 2000s Spurs who won the championship every other year, what, four times in a row, right? Mm -hmm. It's We don't know because it's a different game in these different eras with different rules with different players. And so, so, so I hate this talk and just interjecting. This is, was designed to create a fight. Yes. And if we change the conversation, we can avoid the fight. And because, it's because we can say who was the greatest Negro league player ever. You just said satchel something. Satchel page. Satchel, satchel page. page is, is probably you know, Nolan Ryan before Nolan Ryan, because one of the one of the other things about the Negro League and why it's hard to to figure out the stats 
And why it's hard to square that circle is because it was a smaller league with fewer games because there were less people. I mean, it was a smaller proportion of the population. And so a lot of those guys would go, they would go play a second season in the Caribbean. So Satchel Page would go to Cuba and he would play a bunch of games in Cuba. So we have no idea how many yeah, innings it, this guy it, actually pitched. If you want to integrate and say who, who who's probably should be on the top, I'm sorry, we've got now the most inclusive makeup you can have, mm -hmm. and we all lose to the Dominicans. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just, yeah, because, you yeah, go that's per a good population. Point. Uh, that, the, that's a good point about the different eras because, okay, well, it wasn't integrated here. It was integrated here, but it wasn't. It wasn't international yet. Not really. All right. So so then do you have to go to when, when did things start to become really international with with like Pedro Mania, who was who was a, a pitcher for the um, a, a pitcher from Mexico for the uh, uh, for the Dodgers, who was kind of the first really big Latin superstar in, in baseball. And that kind of blew the, the barn doors open for scouts to start going down into Latin America saying, oh, I need to find the next this guy. Right. So it's hard to square that circle and and a a really good point steve kim brought up in this discussion was and i'm i'm kind of kicking myself that the last time i was in kansas city i don't remember when it opened but uh the last time i was in kansas city i wanted to go to the negro league museum and uh hall of fame which is in kansas city um because the kansas city monarchs were kind of the biggest team and uh, and they kind of lasted the longest um and I've talked about Buck O'Neill, who was who was a player and their last manager. And he was a part of he was like a fixture when the when the Kansas City Royals moved to town and, be, and became the Kansas City Royals. And. Um, and he was a great storyteller. He was a great fan and ambassador of baseball and, and watching him on Ken Burns documentary, I've said before, is what made me re fall in love with baseball, because here you have this 80 year old guy who could be bitter. Cause he grew up in the segregated deep South. He grew, he was born and raised in Florida and, and he, he talked about going into baseball cause he didn't want to work in the sugarcane fields cause it was hot, nasty, hard work. Um, and he could have been bitter. And yet he talks about being a kid and hearing a, about Babe. I mean, hearing on the radio and reading the stat sheets and being blown away by, um, So, so for those that are yeah, so for those that are oh, listening, uh, just listening, uh, I brought up the uh, the how many people, uh, what percentage of people from the Dominican Republic make up the MLB, and it's ten percent. So, what do you think? And there's another tab there. What do you think the Dominican Republic population is? Not even close to <laughs> compared small. to the U.S. It's it's I'm going to guess it's like 30, 20 to thirty million. Oh, you guessed low. Am, am I am or I, high? It is eleven. Oh my gosh, three million. So one thirtieth of our population is ten percent of mm. the MLB. That is what we call overrepresentation. So where are you, DEI people, right now? Mm -hmm. uh, That's uh, making not fair. sure the MLB is fair. Yeah, because we should we should have a we should we should replace the that twenty percent there of, of yeah. representation with, uh, with, uh, people from the inner city, but no, 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 this, this was the point is you can't compare because mm -hmm. we don't know. And what we know, what I do know about sports, and this is actually, I would love a study done on this, but it would be so politically incorrect is popularity of sport versus representation. So what do we see in jujitsu? Lots of Brazilians, right? It's very disproportional to the population of Brazil compared to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But it's the national sport there. Dutch kickboxers. The Netherlands is actually quite small when it comes to population. Oh, yeah. But there are a shit ton of Dutch kickboxers because it's the national sport there. Mm -hmm. The United States and basketball. We win almost every year, although it's getting a little bit more diverse, but when it was popular, because basically our best athletes went to play basketball. Those same athletes in another country, in France, for instance, were playing soccer. 
football, excuse me, football in France. Uh, you know, in, in the Netherlands, they're kickboxing. In Brazil, they're doing jujitsu. In, uh, I don't know, Oceania, they're swimming. I don't care. You know, it's, but the, we can't compare these things because the demographics change. Mm -hmm. The and, style changes. And here's the, it, there's not just the, this doesn't make sense because you can't merge these two stats, these two groups of stats. But back to the point, stealing from Steve Kim that he made that I thought was a really good point is, okay, well, you've merged the stats. So now are you going to merge the Hall of Fames? Why not? If, the, if if you're merging the stats, then doesn't that mean you should take all these busts from the Negro, Negro League Hall of Fame and move them to Cooperstown? And, 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 and to the point he was making is, as as important as integration was, the bitter sweetness of it was that it destroyed the Negro League because there was no longer a need for it. There was no longer a point mm -hmm. for it. So the Negro League, after integration, they, lasted, they I want to say, like five to eight just, years. It just... It just went away. All, all the best went, players oh, started to go sucks. into the majors. So all the best players started to go into the majors. And so then eventually the the teams ran out of quality players. They ran out of, of fans because those fans were now spending their time watching and listening to the majors. Well, so, 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 so here's what I propose. Let's integrate the WNBA and the NBA. <laughs> But then retroactively take all the stats from the WNBA and compare them to NBA players. Mm -hmm. This is this is the point I'm making is the the population is different, right? So if you look at the stats, these women playing women, theoretically, these women playing women, uh, they have certain stats going back into the past. But they're integrated into this other league that has stats going into the past which some of those women playing women would beat the women playing men, but we put them together. So we're going to go ahead and just say, oh, well, Cheryl Swoops beats, you know, uh, I don't know who's a shooter, uh, Clay Thompson. You know, Cheryl Swoops beats Clay Thompson in these statistics before we integrated. But would Cheryl Swoops really beat Clay Thompson in the new integrated league? Probably not. In, prob in fact, she probably would be sweeping the floor. That's that's the, the that's the way it is. Now, I'm not saying that's the same. That's exactly the same analogy because there were people that would have been very well integrated into the MLB during that time. Yeah. But but I'm just saying I'm using it an, an, an exaggerated analogy to say no, we don't know. Could Brittany Grimer probably play in the NBA? Maybe we don't know. I mean, give her a shot, I guess. And if she plays well, she does. If she doesn't, she, we, we know, you know, but at the same time, it's not the same. She, she could play in the NBA maybe, but well, especially she, now where she's not going to get, you know, you brought, up, you brought up the Pistons and yeah, yeah. Go, go bring up highlights of Jordan versus the Pistons and, and the Pistons are committing third degree assault live on television. Yeah, they made a video game called Bill Lambeer's Combat Basketball where you were <laughs> played cyborgs that beat each other up while you were playing basketball. But it's uh, no, but OK, so maybe she could play in the NBA, but she wouldn't dominate like she did in the WNBA. So it's it it changes the 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 stats she had there would not be the same in the other one, and you know and 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 that's not just on genders or races or anything. It's styles too. I bet you the Negro League had a different style than the MLB, and we see those styles yeah. change over time. No, right now, that, right now, yes. it's all about velo yes. and the fastball, where it used to be about the curveball and change ups and. How can we finagle these things? But before that, it was Nolan Ryan and it was the fastest. No, th that's it a really is. good point yeah. because a after what is called the uh, the dead ball era. So for those of you who aren't dorks like me, they called it the dead ball era because it was much harder to hit homers and extra base hits. And you had to manufacture runs by playing small ball because they didn't really police the ball. So they used, unless they lost it, they used the same ball for the whole game. That meant the ball started acting funky later, the longer the game went on. And and pitchers would like, 
you know, they got the, the big honking chew in their mouth. When they're sitting there working it, they'd spit on it. They'd spit tobacco juice on it and grind it in to make the ball act funky, to make it spin almost like a knuckleball, right? So that's why it's called the dead ball era. Then someone got killed because they, they took a ball to the head. And they said, oh, okay, we got to stop this. So we need the ball to act. We're, we're going to. That's when they started introducing new balls. They started policing the you can't scuff the ball. You can't spit on the ball. And and once it gets scuffed up, we're going to replace it. And that's and that was kind of the 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 perfect moment in history for Babe Ruth, because here you have this big guy who's a power hitter who happens to come along right when the dead ball era is ending. OK, mm-hmm. the reason Jackie Robinson and then the people after him made such a big impact is because the Negro League still basically pay, played both. So they still played small ball, but. Where they could, they didn't have the funds, but where they could, they would, you know, ch- change the ball up. They they would, you know, try and police the scuffing and all that. So you would still have the long ball, but you still also had to play small ball. So they played both. And that's why Jackie Robinson was such a revelation. And it wasn't just his athleticism, although he was a tremendous athlete because he was not just a great baseball player, but he was a almost Olympic level track star. Uh, at well, Jackie at Robinson USC. always said baseball was my fifth best sport. Yeah, he he was <laughs> he was a uh, he was a track star. He was a football star uh, at USC. I think he went to USC anyway. So that's why he was such a revelation is because you introduced oh we can do both and and the majors hadn't been playing small ball in so long that he came along and he did this. I've I've talked about this when I ranted about why it was racist to change the name from the Washington Redskins is because. The reason they were called the Redskins is because at the time there was something called Indian ball because possibly the greatest athlete ever, Jim Thorpe, he he not only played, but then he coached football at a small Indian college in Oklahoma and, and through kind of the plains in the Midwest where you had all these Indian schools, they played a particular style of football. And that's what the founder owner of the Washington Redskins wanted. He wanted that style of play. So he went out and he got himself a coach who was part Sioux and coaching at one of these colleges. And he said, Hey, I want this style of ball. You go find me players who can play like this. And they called themselves the Redskins. That's where the name came from is because it was, it was honoring these people and this style of play and it kind of revolutionized the NFL to introduce this style of play. And then eventually that led to, you know, different changes and whatnot. And, and the frustrating part to me as, as a historian, someone who loves history is this, this stems from this delusional utopianism of Marxism and Marxist ideology. And and even if you're not talking political Marxism, the philosophy of it is utopian. And that's what leads us to, you know, the Marxist roots of CRT and DEI of we can perfect humanity and we can even go backwards and perfect the past. No, you can't. Merging the stats of the Negro League and the Major League does not protect the past. It does perfect the past it does not wipe away the sins but of it our made some people feel good about but themselves. it makes people feel better in the moment and but it but what you're actually doing in the same way that you are minimizing the the suffering and the sacrifices of the men who fought and the men women and children who suffered under the third reich to call what is to call your political opponents nazis it minimizes what happened, the true suffering and heroism of the past. You are you are now reducing what happened, what these people went through by attempting to perfect it. Rather than saying what happened was, it, it is a shame that it had to happen, that the Negro League happened because of this bigotry, but we should also study and celebrate what they accomplished. Yes, it was separate, and it's a damn shame it had to be separate, but look what they did. You're giving, so I hate to be the pessimist of the two of us, 
but you're giving the people who are responsible for this merging too much credit. The real answer is the reaction is the point. Yes. They did it not because they were good meaning and wanted to do this with this secondary effect that you're talking about. They did it because they wanted to piss people off. And then the pissed off people will say something probably racist in the process. And that would get the reaction they wanted to say, see, all of these people are racist. Sorry, I'm the pessimist here, but that's the reality. The people who are responsible for this, they're activists. Otherwise, nobody would have cared enough to do anything. The only people who care enough to do anything are the freaking activists. Otherwise, people do like what we're talking about and say, well, let's just go on and acknowledge these people. Uh, that that is that is why i think i have not seen any buzz about lawman bass reefs now i haven't watched any ye of yellowstone or its prequels i've heard it's great i don't really care i'm not yeah i'm, I'm not but... going to because i already know everything because i have some clients that talk about it in the morning because mm -hmm. because they watch it and i'm like look i'm not going to watch it y'all can talk whatever you're not going to spoil anything so but bass reeves they haven't watched Mm -hmm. So that, that was a good intro for me because there is no, there is no over the top inserting of, um, modern sensibilities for the modern audience in this. There is, no, it's a good story about mm -hmm. someone, uh, a, a lawman that happened to be black as uh, I think Coleman Hughes would say is this, this, mm -hmm. this, and this that happens to be black. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, Oh, this is, this is refreshing. This is great. At, so as Donald Sutherland says, when he call when he brings him in to give him the oath to make him a deputy U S marshal is, you know, I can't remember exactly what he says, but he says something along the lines of, I need people who are, I need men who are a good shot with a straight spine. So it's, it's not just, that you're tough, that you can handle a gun. It is that you have the moral code to enforce the law and not be corrupted by this authority. That is why he is an incredible person and an incredible character in the story of history, because he was uncorruptible. And you see that, you see that in the show. And one of the things that I, I, I didn't really notice at first because when i was watching with you i'd watch the first episode and then i happened to be walking through walmart to get something else and when i grabbed the blu-ray extended editions of lotro which i've been meaning to get forever and when i got a new tv i thought let's inaugurate it with lotro and i grabbed it and i happened to see lawman bass reeves sitting there on the shelf below it and i was like oh dang i gotta get this too because i liked the first episode that much and so one of the things you get in the first episode that I thought was really interesting and, and rather subtle is the way scripture was used to justify the evil of slavery. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was telling and interesting that his master was a professed atheist or, or at least a non-believer. He didn't believe there was anything out there. He didn't believe there was anything afterwards. And he thought, you know, that the the suffering of life indicated there wasn't a God. Which and has always he, been a horrible argument to me, but yeah. as the athe atheist of the two, and, that, that, that's the worst argument you can have. And yet, when they have their falling out at the end of that episode, um, something that you might not have caught is he's citing scripture to Bass about, about being submissive to your master. He's citing scripture. That does not fave Bass in the slightest. Bass cites scripture back at him. So, yes, it's true that people in the South cherry picked scripture to justify slavery and still maintain their Christian identity. It's also true that the abolitionist movement was founded in the church. And it, it is telling that despite all he went through, it didn't phase Bass Reeves faith and it didn't phase it didn't change his moral code. And, you, and, and that comes back up again later when he's with Dennis Quaid's character and he's, he's, he's starting to get into this world of, of law enforcement. And Dennis Quaid is another one of these jaded, 
jaded souls. Uh, although his, his racism is against Indians because of what they did to him mm -hmm. versus, you know, the slave owner of, of master. Yeah. Reed, he survived a scalping or something like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 yeah he survived. A, he survived a scalping. Um, and again, that doesn't, that doesn't change. Bass Reeves has no problem telling him white, red, black, we're all men. Which uh, I meant to say it while we were watching it, but it's, it's better here. I think that was that, that line there was specific, was a very, very, very purpose, purposeful line to connect the Martin Luther King. I am a man sign. Mm -hmm. We're all men. I am a man. I'm not black. I'm not white. I'm not Indian. I'm the, I am a man. Which, you know, doesn't include the feminist movement, but, you know, it's, <laughs> I mean, some females now might call themselves a man. I don't know. Well, let's not go down that rabbit hole. Oh, yeah. But well, I, I, rabbit suspect holes that is, I suspect that is a reason that it's not getting the buzz because it is not for modern audiences. It is, it is a good story told simply. And it happens to be that it is, you know, Hollywood has been telling us for decades that we're all racist and complaining about Oscar. So why you run the Oscars, you idiot. This story has been here for 150 years and no one bothered to make it. So far as I know, this is the first time Bass Reeves has been on the, the screen. Um, I should look that up to double check it. But the, the point being, while you were sitting here calling us racists, you could have made this movie years ago. You know, that was one of the first things I thought of because I'm as an Oki, I know I already knew this story. And remember the um, the Magnificent Seven remake with Denzel Washington. Mm -hmm. So in, in the. Uh, I was wondering if that character was influenced by Bass Reeves because he is a that character is a bounty hunter, um, a, a, a deputized. I don't think he's a U.S. Marshal, but he is a, a legal, a legally uh deputized bounty hunter uh so you know dog the bounty hunter in the 1870s and he's also got this great mustache which made me think is is he being inspired by bass reeves here because he's kind of got the look plus he's kind of doing the same job and it, and it always made me wonder that and it made me think man he would make a good bass reeves in a, in a movie about this guy that movie came out like 15 years ago it, it, Hollywood couldn't be bothered to, to tell this story. But now oh. along comes this kid from Texas who just loves Westerns and loves the West. And he's like, hell yeah, I'll produce this movie. And, and, and it took, I didn't know this, but you were looking it up that the, the actor, the lead actor whose name I can't pronounce David. Uh, uh, yeah. It, yeah. He he's, he's definitely at least first generation from, mm -hmm. Uh, and, West Africa, but yeah. he, yeah, he was trying to, uh, yeah, I looked up the story. He, he was trying to get this show made for 10 years and he came across Taylor Sheridan. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's right up Sheridan's alley with Yellowstone and with the prequels to Yellowstone and um, a uh, wind river is another one. When I was looking up where Sheridan got a start, if you haven't seen it, I think it's, I think it was a Netflix movie, so it should still be on there. Uh, it's, it's Jeremy Renner and what's her face who plays the Scarlet witch uh, and it's it's kind of a modern western because it takes place in Wyoming. Blah blah blah. Murder mystery. Great movie. Uh, he Scarlet wrote. Which? Like, what are you talking about from the Marvel? Yeah. Oh, uh, I remember her Olsen. Name. Olsen. Yeah. Yeah. So so they're in it. Um, She's hot. Yep. Uh, nice butt. Uh, anyway, that's the highlight of the movie for me. No, no. Uh, so that's another kind of modern western. Uh, I've heard Sicario has has kind of some he, he he wrote that and it's it kind of has some western elements to it although it's a it's a very much a modern day you know telling but it, it's right up his alley and i i'm not surprised in the slightest that he he said heck yeah to this this project um and it's it It's very telling and very depressing that this isn't getting the kind of buzz that it should. Um, even amongst, you know, some of the people I watch, like the nerdrotic people, I haven't heard any of them mention it, but they yeah, talk I about Yellowstone I, all the time. Yeah, I haven't seen Drinker 
maybe maybe I'll I'll message Drinker on one of his things to to get his take on it. Uh, see if he'll he'll answer that. Uh, but uh, you know, at the same time, Amazon Prime is throwing at me a new interview with the vampire, which is all a black cast. Which, <sighs> okay, so you it's uh, I'm one of the hardest people to trigger there is, but Interview with a Vampire was one of the best movies ever made, and the protagonist antagonist kind of dynamic because it's Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise, mm-hmm. and I can't remember the girl who played the young girl, but the original vampire was a plantation owner. That's the whole thing. He was this guy who sold his soul to the devil because he was the rich white guy who owned a plantation in Louisiana and New Orleans. How do you make a black plantation owner in New Orleans? It you you're you're the okay so at least if you're going to swap make it make sense you know the whole argument you can't complain that about ariel because who knows what color a mermaid is that's okay you you at least have that argument but a plantation owner in the south during the 1800s that's actually pretty set in history of what that should look like. And that's part of the evil. Remember, he was evil. Mm-hmm. I just don't get it. I I, I, I oh. haven't watched the show, so maybe they do something to yeah. finagle that. But at the same time, you're ruining one of the most, the, the most well-made movies ever made. Along with that, the the blade reboot was announced something like five years ago and it's still been languishing in pre-production how hard is it wesley snipes killing vampires done it's not a complicated formula (laughs) and i I can't remember the name of the guy who's attached to the project as blade but he's a pretty darn good actor himself and he's got the physicality to play blade but they keep trying to feminize the script is what what i've been hearing Mm. and that's that's one of the reasons it's been languishing is is because they keep going through these various iterations well, where Blade I can fix is it. basically you can feminize the script and have a trans man play Blade. Then you can have a masculine feminine script. <laughs> uh I don't want to live in this planet anymore. <laughs> Take we me need, away, we, Professor Farnsworth. We need to close this one out. We're at two hours ish. Yeah. So yeah. uh no, uh we need to talk Caitlin Clark again because uh there are some things going on with that mm-hmm. that are are screwy, but at the same time, I think is a uh because we wanted to talk male female dynamics too, but this is also a, a she has opened up the window to female sports, which is uh the reason why a lot of female coaches, and I can speak to this from my industry, don't like working with female athletes. Because there is no team involved here because she stands out. Yeah. And uh, well, we, we can preface it with, with this video. I had it pulled up because I didn't know where we were going all the way. But this could be something that we expound upon. So this is a former NBA player who played with Kobe. He played with Shaq. He played with all those guys. Uh, oh, you know what? Hold on. I need to share with sound. But listen to his words. And we might take this as like the main subject next time. Is he on? Is he with Patrick Bet David, or it did value? No, team I, I knew. I, I just, I just knew they shared it, so that's okay. where I went to find it. Yeah, uh, we'll just full screen that. Hold on. Okay. So the uh, last name is Barnes, uh, but he, he's. You can see you've got Kobe behind him, Tupac behind him there. So there's a hot topic uh, going on right now. Caitlin Clark says she got cheap shotted against the sky. I mean, throughout the season, she's been getting beat up. Hard screens, elbows, knocked down. It is what it is. She's not the first. She won't be the last. My issue and my question is, where the fuck are her teammates at? Where are y'all at? Where are the rest of the Indiana Fever at? I've seen a couple girls smirk when she's got knocked down, half-assed to pick her up. Like, y'all supposed to protect the asset, protect the star. And all this is the team, she's the star. You always protect your star. I was someone who protected the stars. You fuck with Kobe, CP, Blake, list goes on. I'm a, it, it's going to be a problem because you guys are supposed to be a family. 
And you wonder why you sit at the bottom of the league right now is because y'all don't protect each other, man. Coach don't do shit about it. Players don't shoot, do shit about it. Y'all should be ashamed of it. But the rest of the league is going to. Yeah, exactly. So this actually, I was thinking about it after I saw that clip. This might be the main reason why female sports are not as popular as male sports. Because they don't like someone standing out. That's a good point. Basketball exploded in the 80s primarily because Bird versus George, or not George, Bird versus Magic. You had you not only had a star, you had two stars on opposite ends of the country that met repeatedly in the finals. That made basketball explode. Because it, it was not what, you know, it, it it became what it is now in popularity because of Magic versus Bird. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and look then, at look and at then right after that, you have Jordan coming in as the megastar. Look at smaller sports. Why were they why were they popular? And you can take race out of this because some people are trying to say because she's a white girl. That's why it is. No, look at track and field. Who exploded track and field on yeah. the scene? Carl Lewis and Flojo. Mm -hmm. Right. They're mm -hmm. the ones that brought track and field onto the scene. Uh, look at uh, swimming. Michael Phelps. Did anybody pay attention to swimming before Michael Phelps? Swimmers. Wayne, Wayne Gretzky <laughs> brought hockey to a bunch of people who who wouldn't have been paying attention. You know, especially you know the farther south you go, where hockey isn't a sport because mm -hmm. you don't have the facilities. Yeah, uh, Travis Kelty Kelsey brought a bunch of females into football, right? You know, it's you, but you no, know, that that actually is a, is a major point because we can talk about Travis Kelsey as a tight end as guys all day long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But his celebrity status and dating Taylor Swift brought women into football. So all of these things bring an audience and we should be celebrating this person. But the problem with female sports is they hate someone standing out. Yeah. And, and yeah. that what's what's the most popular female sport in the world? It's got to be it's got to be soccer. No, no. Gymnastics. gymnastics duh gymnastics gymnastics and what's different duh. about gymnastics versus all other sports it e even in the team competition it's individual it's individual so you stand out because you have to stand out mm -hmm. you stand out because you're doing your routine nobody does anything together it's not like synchronized swimming you don't have synchronized gymnastics right and probably second to that would probably be you know at least in the past maybe basketball and soccer have gotten bigger now but in the past, it was gymnastics, and then in the winter, it was figure skating, women's figure skating. Yeah, figure skating, which you basically are alone. You're out there alone. So you you can't hate on the person because they are the team. Mm -hmm. All these team sports, someone actually elevates above everybody else, they hate that person. Whereas yeah. in men's sports, they say team captain. Well, let's, let's, let's leave it there. We'll go deeper into that next time, but but... I've been shaking my head and laughing when I keep hearing the, oh, it's only because she's white. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah. She also sure. broke every scoring record. She also broke P Pistol Pete's scoring record, by the way. Yeah, be so, because, and... <laughs> because white kids in the 90s weren't singing along to be like Mike. Right, yeah, sure. No, it's only because she's white. It's not because she's great at what she does. If, and people like great. If white plays a role in it, it's because she is in a predominantly black sport. That's the only place it might play a role. Other than that, we have plenty other sports where yeah. the the person There's other could things be, that, yeah. that play a role here, but I'm going to save my thoughts for next time. I'm just going to tease. I think okay, that's a good so topic. Yeah. If it's, a... if it's not because she's a white girl, then what is it about? Because again, you can't say, oh, it's only because she's white unless you just forget that Michael Jordan exists. So shut up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or Kobe or any of those. I, th I, I actually, I'm, I'm on the board. I'm, the, if you talk about the goat of basketball, I'm, I'm a Kobe guy, but uh, Jordan, Jordan is, is right there. So I'm not, yeah. a, I'm not a, all right, well, we'll, we'll go down that rabbit hole um, Wednesday. I guess if, if something actually comes out of these Fauci hearings, then maybe we'll talk about it, but I don't see the point right now because, 
there's nothing new here. It's just saying the same things we've it, been It's all stuff we've talked about for years. the last yeah. several years. 270 episodes. Of, yeah. You know. it, not only is it not new, but so far as I can tell, absolutely nothing of consequence is going to happen because of this. So what, what what's the point? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just filling time. It's just making content. And we try not to be about that. Yeah. But. But speaking of quality content, hopefully we'll have some quality content um, Friday. Uh, we should be able to get through a good chunk of Towers of Midnight. I, I don't know if we'll make it to the end, but we might be able to because there's a lot of action that's happening. So we can skip over some big chunks here and, and, and talk about the, the, the hows and the whys and the whos. Yep, sounds good. I, I think I looked through some of the comments. They look good to talk about as well. So... Yeah, we'll be back Friday. Uh, I will remember to put this up on time this time because it's 2.05 and I think I'm actually done working for the day. So uh, so we'll get that up. Sorry, going two hours. I thought this was going to be a quick one, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But we went, so, we went down some rabbit holes. I regret nothing. <laughs> I regret nothing. Yes. All right. And we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, we need to talk uh, male-female relationship stuff, which will go with the, uh, the Caitlin Clark stuff, I think. The mm -hmm. difference between men and women. Uh, think of something really controversial we can talk about, and and uh, we'll. Hit oh, because that's not controversial enough. It's not. Okay, if, if, if we're gonna bring Caitlin Clark into it, we're uh, inevitably going to bring race back into it. So yeah, we have both gender and race, but it's not controversial enough. So I don't yeah. know. Maybe I could find a way to bring abortion into it. <laughs> but I'd do her. I mean, wouldn't you? <sighs> she's she's pretty cute. All right. We'll talk about that, that next time <laughs> All right, later guys